Okay, I think we can, we can start. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to SOAS. Um, we're very pleased to see many of you here attending this pre-launch event of the UNECA report. This report is going to be officially launched in uh, April, beginning of April. Um, but this night we have the opportunity to actually start this discussion with uh, many of you. Um, my name is Antonio Andreoni. I'm a lecturer in the economics department and I convened the uh, industrial development and policy cluster hosted by the economics department uh, here at, at SOAS. This is a research cluster that uh, brings together researchers from SOAS and beyond, uh, as well as policymakers who are dealing with structural transformation, technological change, manufacturing development, developmental finance, and so on and so forth, um, in Africa, Asia, and uh, Middle East. Uh, we run a regular lecture series, and this is in fact the seventh event uh, since we started, and this has involved international leading scholars. Uh, we've been having Robert Wade some time ago, uh, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, Rafi Kaplinski, and so on and so forth. And I, at the end of this meeting, I will announce the next events that we are going to, to host. Um, this night event was made possible by the active participation of one of the working groups uh, within the cluster, which is the ETA Economic Transformation in Africa Working Group, which is an initiative launched by uh, a group of PhD students in SOAS and Cambridge, uh, which received support from the uh, INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, this is another group organizing seminars, reading groups, and other activities in, 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 uh, in focusing in particular on structural transformation and technological change in Africa. This night is a really uh, special night in uh, this series because we are hosting this event with uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and we are extremely pleased to have you here. Um, as Adam later will, will, will uh, talk in more detail, uh, UNEC has been doing pioneering work and promoting pioneering work on industrial transformation, and is one of the main reference points in, in, uh, among African countries in, on, on this team. Uh, and many of our colleagues in the economics department have been contributing to their intellectual discussion. So this is actually a continuation of a dialogue that we've been uh, having over, over the last years. There is a final uh, reason why this night is special is because we have a very distinguished scholar, uh, uh, Ajun Chang from the University of Cambridge. Uh, he's reader in the political economy of development there and has been there for 25 years. Um, is one of the most well-known institutional development economists. His work has been focusing on industrial development and policy, institutional economics, and many other key topics in the current development debate. Uh, among his books, you will uh, uh, recognize uh, The Political Economy of Industrial Policy, 1994, Kicking Away the Ladder, Bad Samaritans, 23rds, They Don't Tell You About Capitalism, or recently, The Economics User Guide. I'm particularly pleased to have Ajun this night here because Ajun also agreed to become an associate member of the economics department. So we are extremely uh, uh, happy to, to, to start this discussion with him this night. Um, the format of the night will be, uh, we will have Ajun presenting uh, the main uh, findings uh, of this report, which is a quite uh, big report. So we, we are going to go through a number of uh, 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 many issues, actually, each chapter of this report, but we will actually leave to the discussion then the possibility to go deeper into, into, into the analysis. This report has been written also by other uh, colleagues from the University of Cambridge, in particular, uh, Justin um, Lor Og, who has been is doing currently the PhD with the June on, uh, uh, global value, on the effects of global value chain expansion on African industrial policy and uh, with a particular focus on Ethiopia. And um, after... Uh, I was going to say, um, another good reason why we are, you know, pleased to have uh, Justin here is because Justin was actually one of our uh, product, if we want to use this. <laughs> I'm very happy to use uh, this expression. Um, and uh, after that, we are going to have um, uh, Adam Elirakai, Elira oh gosh, um, who is going, sorry for that, who is going, who is um, a director of the macroeconomic policy division within uh, the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Africa, who is going to give us a very important overview of uh, really how this report is linked to their activities and what other type of initiatives they are uh, at the moment uh, developing. So um, for those of you who are a uh, fan of Twitter, uh, please use the hashtag uh, SOAS in capital letters, e, con, um, e in capital letters. Sophie, is it correct? Um, 
Great. Um, so thanks, thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, we are going to have 30 minutes discussion, 15, and, and uh, so we will have almost one hour for proper uh, discussion. Let me give you this. Okay, let me start uh, while Antonio is uh, setting this up. Uh, no, thank you everyone for coming. It's my great pleasure to be in Suez, my second home. Uh, and I know so many people here. I, I mean, uh, sometimes I think that this is uh, where I work. Uh, and I even see some uh, the students from Cambridge that are sitting here, so I'm even more confused. Eh? <laughs> well, the, this report was uh, commissioned to our team, myself, Yostein, and Muhammad Irfan, who now works for the Pakistani Ministry of Commerce and Industry. The, about a year ago, and yeah, we I mean, the, submitted this report at the end of the summer, and then it has been revised and uh, going through various uh, last-minute uh, preparation and uh, will be launched uh, officially in April uh, in, in the, the, the regular UNECA annual meeting. But this is uh, your chance to have a sneak preview. Yeah? I mean, this is uh, the things that uh, you get only when you are friends of you know, Hollywood producers and so on. So you know, I'm glad that uh, we are giving you that. Well, the report uh, the consists of uh, four main parts. Uh, the first chapter is, uh, the, of course, uh, the introduction. The second chapter critically reviews uh, the prevailing discourses on African development. First, uh, the so-called African growth tragedy uh, arguments uh, associated with uh, names like Paul Collier and Jeffrey Sachs. And William Easterly, you know, argument that somehow Africa has all these uh, geographical, historical, cultural, natural conditions that make it impossible to develop. And then, of course, that uh, the world uh, that uh, has these uh, moments of uh, the, the manic depression. So now it's in the manic mood about uh, Africa, Africa rising, yeah? African lions instead of uh, the Asian tigers. Yeah? No, it's uh, actually quite amazing, this uh, you know, about turn. And then uh, we have uh, the, the next chapter that uh, talks about theories of uh, industrial policy. And the fourth chapter is review of industrial policy experiences in a wide range of countries. I'm not going to go into the detail now. And in the final the, the substantive chapter, the chapter five, we discuss whether industrial policies are still possible because even among the supporters of industrial policy, there's now this uh, prevailing view that it's not possible anymore. You know, The WTO, bilateral free trade agreement, regional free trade agreement like uh, EPA, uh, Economic Partnership Agreement, you know, the rise of global value chain. It would be nice if you could do this, but it's not possible anymore. So we address that question. I'm not really going to dwell on the chapter two. I mean, I can always uh, come back if you want, but, you know, I mean, amazing range of things have been cited as uh, the reasons why Africa will never develop, you know, climate, geography, history, culture is uh, quite amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the things like this, you know, Samuel Huntington, the author of you know, the famous book, uh, Clash of Culture at uh, Civilizations, commenting on the, the comparison of uh, Ghana and South Korea, you know, had uh, this to say, you know, basically saying that Ghanans cannot develop because they are Ghanans. Yeah? <laughs> well, what else is it? Yeah? Well, the, the, very quickly, the point is that all these uh, metastructural factors have existed throughout Africa's uh, post-independent -in history. But why did it that, that, uh, manage to do better in the 1960s and 70s? You know? I mean, Africa's, uh, that, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's, uh, especially 
per capita income in the last uh, 30 years has been stagnant. Yeah? The region, the sub-region managed to grow at 1.52% in the 60s and 70s. Yeah? So if uh, history, culture, these things are so important, it should have been more important earlier than now. And there are things that, you know, hasn't changed like uh, the, the location in the tropics. So how come, you know, these uh, were not such an obstacle in the earlier period, but you know, uh, became so important in the la later period? Well, basically the point is that, uh, that uh, these arguments are used as excuses to explain why all these uh, supposedly correct policies of structure adjustment program didn't work. Yeah? Uh, part of uh, what I call the ABP discourse, yeah? anything but policy. Yeah? It's actually amazing how much that, that uh, research has come out since the 1990s to explain growth failures in developing countries in terms of anything but policy. Yeah? This is very strange because uh, in the 1970s, when some dependency theories that uh, try to explain the economic successes of uh, Korea and Taiwan, which they had you know, predicted impossible by using geopolitical argument, you know, historical argument, neoclassical economists poo poo this idea. You know? you know, economics is economics everywhere. I mean, it shouldn't matter whether it's uh, Ghana or Germany. You know? Now that their theories are not working, they have to find excuses. And what do they find? Exactly the same thing. You know? Korea developed only because of American support. You know? kind of uh, argument. Anyway, I mean, look at the case of Ethiopia. I mean, according to people like uh, the Professor Sachs, that uh, it should have uh, completely crashed in the last uh, 15 years, because when Eritrea that, that, uh, seceded, it became landlocked. Yeah? According to his theory, being landlocked is a disaster. Yeah? Now, this country you know, the accelerated its uh, growth after this event. Yeah? Anyway, I mean, uh, also many of these were present in today's uh, developed countries. So in the end, I mean, uh, many of these uh, the arguments are mixing the symptoms rather uh, the, the, with the causes of uh, underdevelopment. Yeah, so that, uh, the argument like, oh, being landlocked limits uh, your trading possibilities. Yeah? Yes, it does. But, you know, then why is that uh, Switzerland and Austria, yeah? both uh, landlocked uh, countries, why are these two countries that are very rich? Yeah? Because uh, basically they uh, found other ways to trade. Yeah? Oh yeah, and, and as for cultural arguments, you go back long enough, uh, you will find all kinds of negative comments about people who are supposed to have uh, developed because of the right culture, like the Germans, the Japanese, and the Koreans, you know, Germans are stupid, they are too emotional, Japanese don't keep time, they are lazy, Koreans are the worst people in the world. No, really, I mean, and this was said by the supposed uh, leader of uh, Fabian socialism. Yeah? So if a socialist uh, thought like that, you can imagine what the other people thought uh, like that, <laughs> about uh, my ancestors. Huh? No, this is uh, frankly the worst uh, that, uh, description of any people by anyone I can uh, uh, lay my hands on. Yeah? And as for all this uh, uh, Africa rising discourse, you know, basically the explanation is that Africa has sorted out all these problems uh, through uh, structural adjustment, so I have become yeah, more conducive but, uh, to take off. Yeah, and uh, the, you know, I mean, it's not totally unfounded, but you know, basically it's uh, implying that uh, it's uh, now doing well because it went through this uh, the, the structural adjustment process. Huh? Well, unfortunately, in per capita terms, Africa's growth has not been very impressive. And even this is unlikely to be sustained in most countries, not everywhere, but uh, in uh, many countries they have relied on 
primary commodities whose uh, prices are falling. And also the growth has been of poor quality in terms of employment and poverty reduction. And we attribute this uh, to the negligible role of uh, manufacturing in the African economies. And that, that there's some typo there. Uh, so the, please excuse us uh, for that. And now moving on to the theoretical perspectives, uh, I'm not going to go through the details. I mean, we discussed the definition of industrial policy and discuss uh, why manufacturing is important, uh, all the usual reasons uh, that uh, many of you know, faster productivity growth, spillover into other sectors in terms of uh, productivity impacts. Also, we extensively criticize the currently popular discourse of post-industrial service economy or knowledge economy. Uh, I don't have uh, time to go into this, but uh, we, we provide basically criticisms that these are, are <coughs> discourses that are very misguided. Yeah? And also it's uh, not able to recognize the interdependence of uh, the high value services and manufacturing, you know, basically high value services like design, engineering, you know, finance. I mean, their customers are mainly manufacturing firms. Eh? So that, that you actually need a, a vibrant manufacturing sector to have these uh, high value services. Also low tradability of uh, the services is a problem for developing countries with balance of payments constraint. And yeah, especially in the African case, this is at, uh, even more, it is even more important to develop manufacturing, the, the well-known terms of trade effect, the <clears throat> impact in terms of uh, the creating secure employment and reducing macroeconomic stability and so on. Now, yeah, let me uh, elaborate on this a little bit. Now, the, we, we talk about two visions of industrial policy. The, currently dominant vision is the neoclassical vision based on this uh, notion of uh, comparative advantage. Now, comparative advantage has two versions. One is Ricardo and the other is uh, neoclassical. Yeah? Ricardo's uh, theory tries to explain trade pattern according to different levels of uh, the, uh, technological the capabilities in different countries, although he sees them as fixed. Yeah? Neoclassical theory, however, actually starts by assuming that all countries have the same technological capabilities. Eh? It's only the differences in the relative endowments in capital and labor that compel them to specialize in different things. Yeah? So if a country like Guatemala is not producing things like BMWs, it's not because they cannot, but because they shouldn't. They find it unprofitable. Eh? For us, uh, this is, you know, like uh, the, the Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Huh? It's assuming away the very essence of development problem. Huh? I mean, developing countries are poor mainly because they lack technological capabilities. Huh? So we argue that we need to base our understanding of industrial policy in the, uh, on, on the theory of infant industry promotion in which uh, the development of technological capability is the key. Of course, this does not mean that uh, we should completely ignore comparative advantage. At least in the short run, you have to take it as given and try to maximize uh, the benefits from it while investing in developing your technological capabilities. And this is exactly what countries like South Korea and Taiwan did. Yeah? They started from the lowest of the lowest, yeah? because in the beginning, their technological capabilities were zero. Yeah? So in the early 60s, the biggest, one of the biggest export items of uh, South Korea was wigs. Yeah? 
I mean, I don't know about today, but apparently in those days that the, the, the workers had to plant each strand of hair onto the artificial scalp or whatever you may call it. Hmm? And this is very labor intensive. You couldn't do it except in countries with yeah, the lowest wages like South Korea. So the, yeah, at that level, it conformed to its uh, the neoclassical comparative advantage, yeah? labor intensive. Yeah? But the whole point is that uh, the, they use the money, the foreign exchange that they earn from this to buy machines and technologies for higher industries. First, electronics, yeah? well, cheap electronics are nothing fancy, yeah? steel, and then motor cars, ships, semiconductors, and so on and so on. Yeah? So these two are not necessarily incompatible. Yeah? Following comparative advantage in some industries is actually necessary to achieve productive uh, capabilities uh, development. Yeah? So after setting that uh, theoretical vision out, we discuss uh, various types of uh, theories of uh, the, the industrial policy, once again, I don't have time to go through them. Demand complementarities, externalities, coordination. And then the, 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 the second category is the capabilities. Of course, the infant industry argument, but some of the other arguments related to technology and support for SMEs. And then we also have the third category that talks about risk and uncertainty involved in industrial development process. And then we talk about uh, implementation issues. Policies have to be realistic, but not too realistic. Yeah? Because if you are completely realistic, you will always be producing the same way cheap transistors, radio, stitched garment. Yeah? You have to push the boundary. Yeah? Needless to say, this uh, the, the, the industrial policy needs to be constantly adapted to changing conditions, and it requires uh, the right political base. Well, at this point, you know, the, the, some people then the, take it to the extreme. I mean, it's a very important point, but uh, take it to the extreme and say, well, we can't do anything because uh, we don't have the right kind of political base for industrial policy. But you know, history has uh, plenty of examples where this has changed. I mean, often involving, but not necessarily always, involving violent processes. So basically, new political coalition for industrial development was built in the United States and Prussia in the late 19th century. In the mid 20th century, this was also done in Latin America and East Asia. Of course, some held, some didn't, but you know, it's always uh, possible to do that. And then we have issues of embedded autonomy, which I assume you all know. We emphasize uh, the issue of pragmatism. You know, Singapore is uh, the, the ultimate example in this regard, because uh, you know, the, when you read about Singapore in the financial press or standard textbooks, you will only hear about Singapore's free trade policy and it's a welcoming attitude towards foreign investors, but you will never hear that 90% of the land is owned by the government and very closely yeah, monitored for industrial planning purpose. 85% yeah. of housing is provided by government-owned housing corporation and a staggering 22% of GDP is produced by state-owned enterprises. Yeah. So is it capitalism, socialism? Yeah. Very difficult to say. Yeah. Also, implementation requires that the, the increasing implementation capabilities, because if you don't have a good policy capabilities, whatever good policy on paper you have, you will not succeed. But I, we emphasize that this does not mean hiring more economists. Huh? No, I mean, uh, th th there's a very serious point here. Huh? Also, we em emphasize that administrative capabilities are not just those possessed by the individuals, but also by organizations. Yeah? So you might have all kinds of uh, people with high degrees, but you know, 
if the government is uh, not well organized, if uh, it lacks internal coordination, then the policies will not be successful. And then we talk about the incentive system. This is well-known stuff. And to moving on to the chapter four, where we talk about the experiences, we really talk about the wide, wide range of countries, Today's rich countries, but also more advanced developing countries, also the poorest developing countries. Now, we completely agree with people who say that you cannot just transplant other countries' experiences, but once again, any sensible point uh, can be taken too far, and it has often been taken too far. You know, uh, you can always uh, learn lessons. You, know? you don't have to copy you know, things that are straightforward. You know? And we gave a range of experiences because we think it is very important to free the policy imagination of the policy makers. You know? Because unless you know these cases, especially in an environment where one particular type of economics, one particular ideology dominates, you just cannot imagine how things can be different. You know, seriously, I mean, I often challenge my students, do you think you could have designed something like Singapore if you relied only on theories, yeah? never mind whatever theories? Yeah? No, you can't. I mean, it's a, a, a product of a pragmatic evolution of policies and unless you know these cases, you will not have the imagination to think of a different uh, alternative. Eh? So we talk about uh, you know, first uh, the experiences of today's uh, rich countries, the post-Second World War period. You, know, you might think that uh, it's uh, just that uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Some people know that France did some of this stuff, but no more than that, but actually there was industrial policy everywhere. I mean, of course, there are different patterns, but hardly any country didn't use any. You know, like, uh, for example, the U.S. is a great example. I mean, I you know, sometimes uh, joke that uh, the most uh, successful, uh, sorry, the United States has uh, the, the most successful state-owned enterprise in human history, except that it's not called a state-owned enterprise. It's uh, called U.S. military. Huh? You know, they may uh, finance uh, the, the, the research and development in all the high-tech industries that uh, you can imagine. Huh? I mean, you probably have heard of you know, computer and uh, the internet and so on, but uh, did you know that uh, semiconductors was initially developed with money from the U.S. Navy? Yeah. We don't hear about these things. And of course, uh, that, uh, that, that the, as a result, uh, the most uh, important industrial policy of the United States is uh, to convince other people that they don't have industrial policy. You know? And then other stupid people like uh, my fellow Koreans say, oh yeah, that, that Americans don't have industrial policy, we should abolish ours. You know? <laughs> I have uh, written, especially in this book about industrial policies of today's rich countries in the earlier period. And I uh, don't want to go into this. I'm just uh, going to you know, uh, show you uh, some of the things. And then we also talk about develop, uh, industrial policy experiences of the more advanced developing countries, as well as some of the poorest countries. Eh? And actually, that uh, we show that even in these rather unpromising cases, you see some success stories in some sectors, showing that you know, despite all the problems of low capabilities, increasingly restrictive uh, global policy environment, and so on you can do some things, yeah? 
So to sum up this uh, empirical chapter, basically that, that we very much emphasize the role of uh, develop, development of uh, productive capabilities. We suggest that countries need to exploit their comparative advantage, but uh, defy, defy it, at least in some sectors. And we show that there are many different paths towards developing productive uh, capabilities. And unless you know a range of real life cases, you would actually not be able to imagine how diverse uh, this could be simply by thinking in theoretical terms. Huh? And also there's a huge range of tools that you can use. Yeah? So trade restrictions, subsidies, coordination, licensing, regulation of FDI, use of state-owned enterprises, government procurement, sorry, and so on. So that uh, you need to also free your imagination about the policy tools because very often people think that it's all about tariff protection and since uh, there are restrictions on that in the WTO, there's uh, no industrial policy that you can do. This is not true. Okay, and then uh, moving on to the last uh, substantive chapter, how the industrial policy environment has changed and how it affects a uh, country's ability to conduct industrial policy. Especially, especially with the establishment of the WTO, but also with the recent proliferation of bilateral and regional agreements on trade and investment there's an increasing, increasingly influential view that industrial policy cannot be used anymore. But this is uh, not true. There are many industrial policy measures that can still be used legally. So for example, the WTO bans export subsidies, but not for the least developed countries, yeah? roughly speaking countries with uh, less than $1,000 per capita income. There are policy measures which are inherently domestic in nature and therefore not subject to international agreements. There are policy measures that are allowed because uh, no international consensus has evolved on how to regulate this. There are lots of ambiguities so that basically as a rule of thumb, we suggested if a policy measure does not affect export or imports directly, it does not fall under the WTO laws and they will fall out. WTO members uh, have been required to bind their tariffs, but not necessarily to eliminate it. Also, currently, many countries use uh, levels of tariffs well below the bound levels, so they can still raise tariffs. You can renegotiate uh, some of these tariffs. You can use extra tariffs to uh, legitimately to address the uh, balance of payments problems. I mean, the, the Korea used to use it a lot, even under the GATT. You know? Ecuador has uh, used this at uh, the uh, uh, two or three times. I think Indonesia and a few other countries have also used it. So why not? Subsidies, yes, I mean, WTO does not actually ban all subsidies. I mean, it's, uh, only the export subsidies and subsidies requiring local contents that are explicitly banned. All other subsidies are actionable, which means that if a country has been injured by another country's subsidy, it can take the other country to the WTO and get a ruling, and in light of the ruling, can impose trade sanction against the offending country. But this process itself uh, takes a few years. Hmm? So you can uh, use it until it's uh, resolved. Yeah? 
more importantly, there are subsidies that can be used more safely. You know, it, until the 1999, they were explicitly allowed <coughs> subsidies uh, for R&D, upgrading of disadvantaged regions, developing environmentally friendly technology. These were explicitly allowed until 1999. Now, they are not. But as far as uh, we could find, there was no case that uh, was brought in this regards to the WTO, probably because these are subsidies mainly used by the rich countries. Eh? So you can, you know, use that uh, the, as a precedent and uh, the, the use it. And if someone challenges you, you have a very you know, good reference uh, point there. Regulation of uh, foreign direct investment is uh, the restricted by the so-called TRIMS agreement, trade-related investment measures. Yes, that uh, these prohibit domestic content requirements and foreign exchange balancing requirements. I mean, this was uh, that, that, uh, frequently used by India, which says that uh, if you're a, for, a foreign company, you have to export at least as much as uh, you are importing. But uh, this uh, cannot be done now. But there are many other measures that you can use to encourage uh, technology transfer and spillover. Yeah? So you can uh, uh, have requirements on joint venture, technology transfer, limitations on the foreign equity ownership, and so on. So the restrictions imposed by the WT, WTO are considerable, but not overwhelming. However, developing countries need to be extremely careful with these uh, bilateral or regional agreements, because they are very aggressive, especially if you sign it with the United States. Eh? I mean, Europeans are only slightly better, you know. Uh, but, you know, you can, at least uh, when it comes to investment agreement, you can renegotiate it. Some countries have actually revoked, yeah, including South Africa, some of uh, the, the investment agreements. Eh? And of course, I mean, the, the many of these agreements you know, have a clause saying, well, even if you uh, the, the revoke it, you will have to give the same treatment to our companies for the next uh, 15 years or whatever. Yeah? So they really make you sure that, 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 that you suffer. But, you know, uh, it's uh, late, uh, better late than never. Yeah? And finally, we talk about uh, the expansion of the global value chains, which yeah, can bring certain benefits. I mean, especially it makes it possible to participate in sectors without developing a whole range of activities. Yeah? So that uh, in the old days, if you want to participate in the automobile sector, you are expected to have an assembly line and then all the things that go with it, like the suppliers and so on. Today, you can become a world-class producer of, uh, say, hubcap, you know. So in that sense, uh, entering the automobile industry has become easier. And yeah, if you do it well, the participation can bring great benefits. Huh? However, I mean, this uh, the proliferation of global value chains is happening in a context of uh, increased consolidation at the top. So lower level participants are finding it increasingly difficult to appropriate the, the, the surplus. So you need to be careful with that. And in the long run, if uh, developing countries are to capture larger shares of profits, they need to upgrade within the global value chains and also eventually create and control at least some of their global value chains. I mean, the, the, once again, you know, Korea started by assembling cheap transistor radios, you know? but then they upgraded within it. So first it was a cheap transistor radio and then the black and white TV and color TV and simple the, 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 the microchips. You know? 
but at some point they said, okay, we are going to do it. Yeah? Samsung will design its own chips. Yeah? They did that, announced it in 1983. Yeah? It was at the time an international joke. Yeah? Yeah, Samsung lost the money for 10 years in electronics. Eh? Uh, sorry, that, uh, in semiconductors. Eh? And if you want to do that, you need intelligent industrial policy. Actually, GBC makes it even more necessary to have an intelligent industrial policy because there are so many things that you have to navigate now. Eh? You know, in, in the old style protectionism, you say, we want to make cars, we put up tariff barrier, any multinational company who finds it attractive enough, uh, given our market size and our level of tariff, please come and invest. Yeah? Well, this is uh, what uh, Brazil did. Yeah? That requires far less uh, that, 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 uh, clever thinking on industrial policy. So in a way, this has uh, made it even more necessary because now you have to you know, really choose the right segment. You need to have a plan to, uh, sorry, the plan to upgrade, possibly plan to branch out and uh, create your own chain. Yeah? You have to think about the linkages, spillovers, and then with the increasing separation of uh, the, the productive services from manufacturing production activities, you also need to think about producer services, which you really didn't worry about in the past. So actually the, the expansion of global value chains has uh, made it in a way more necessary to have clever industrial policy. So let me just uh, that quickly run through summary and conclusion, the importance of productive capability building. This has to be emphasized again and again and again and again, because that's the essence of development. That's what industrial policy should be you know, trying to achieve. Second point, economic theories are necessarily limited, but industrial policymakers need to clearly understand the key theories. So while emphasizing the importance of uh, knowing the key theories, we suggest that the policymakers shouldn't be slaves of uh, theories because they're all limited. Yeah? And industrial policymakers uh, need to acquaint themselves with a range of industrial policy experiences. You know, one of my favorite mottos is that life is stranger than fiction. If you're not convinced, just think Singapore. Eh? No, I mean, that no one could have invented uh, Singapore purely in terms of you know, economic theory and you know, imagination. You know? No. And we argue that without knowing all these uh, different cases, poli policymakers will be bound by theoretical demarcations and cannot fully exercise their policy imaginations, especially in this environment of <clears throat> kind of monolithic uh, the theories. Yeah? You know, even someone like Danny Roderick says that uh, we all have to think in terms of neoclassical uh, theories. Yeah? And he's supposed to be the yeah, left wing fringe of yeah, the mainstream. Yeah? So uh, if you don't know these cases, it's very difficult to break away from this uh, the, the tyranny of a very particular theoretical paradigm. Yeah? Only when you can say, but how about Ethiopia, how about Singapore? Yeah? How about South Korea in the 70s? You can think another you know, world is possible uh, the, as a policymaker. The shrinkage in the policy space and the rise of GBCs have not made the industrial policy irrelevant. If anything, they have made it them, uh, more important. And you know, sometimes you know, people use these uh, the things as excuses uh, not to work. Yeah? No, I, mean, I sometimes joke that the, uh, the biggest friend of uh, developing uh, the, uh, the government officials in the minist 
ministries of uh, industry in developing countries is the, the WTO. Because whenever you don't want to work, you can tell the minister, oh, that's banned by the WTO. Yeah? The ministers are not going to go through 1,450 pages of uh, WTO documents. They say, no, no, actually, you can do it. Yeah? He'll say, OK. So the, we really need to the, 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 take this uh, constraint seriously, but the, the think that the, the, we, we should not think that this is the end of industrial policy. OK, thank you. Hello. All right. Um, so let me use this chance to elaborate further on a few aspects of the report. Um, one of the most common questions I've had directed at me when presenting research that has got, gone into this report is about the role of services versus that of manufacturing in industrial policymaking. Can't services be an equally valid route to development as manufacturing activities? Uh, Hajun talked a bit about this already, but let me elaborate a bit more on why manufacturing is so vital to economic development. Services are indeed more tradable than before. India, for example, has set up lots of call services for non-Indian companies. Rwanda has also managed to derive some success from services like tourism and ICT. And in some digitalized services, you see scale economies that exceed even that of some manufacturing industries. There are plenty of reasons why manufacturing remains such a strong driver <coughs> or a stronger driver than services for economic development. One, the expansion of the services sector is slightly an illusion. Hajun elaborates this on some of his writings in Economics User's Guide. For example, he provides the example of some services being used to be provided in in-house manufacturing operations like catering and security guards, but are now not. Another is a lot of the productivity derived from services um, come from the manufacturing sector. So think about manufacturing computers or transport equipment. And as Hajun already mentioned, low tradability really lies at the root of services. They have, in fact, been stuck at around 20% of international trade since the 1990s. So for countries with a sizable domestic market, as their economies grow, if they continue to rely on imports of all manufacturing products, that's going to cause severe balance of payment problems. And also for African countries, there are plenty of additional reasons why manufacturing uh, will be a stronger driver for economic development than services. One is the uh, deteriorating in terms of trade, the Prebish Singer hypothesis that Hajun mentioned. Another is that manufacturing tends to be a very, very strong driver for employment generation, especially in developing countries. <clears throat> so in a lot of African countries, there's very high vulnerable employment rates. The ILO has recently done some research on this and found that there's a very, very strong correlation between people in paid employment and also the level of industrialization. Another not so much talked about factor is inequality, uh, but the great Political economist Alice Amston focused on this in, in her works and the importance of the manufacturing sector for reducing inequality. She argued that in industries that have higher skills and where knowledge is a barrier to entry, such as manufacturing, wages are likely to be higher. So she, for example, in her recent book, um, Escape from Empire, compares the growth experience of Taiwan and Chile, and Taiwan had a much more rapid rise in wages because they relied more on manufacturing, whereas that Chile has it relied on extractive industries. But however, there are obviously exceptions to this. China has proven an exception, and also, and also uh, Brazil. The second point uh, I wanted to emphasize, or rather elaborate on, is strategies based on emulation uh, of old policies. This is something that we emphasize in the chapter where we provide all the experiences of industrial policy in the past, and some, because some people say nowadays that 
basically emulating or doing industrial policy like it was done in the, by the Asian tigers or even before that, that's not possible anymore. So I wanted, you, I wanted to provide you with the example of Ethiopia, which is a country that I study and show how this country actually uses lots of industrial policies uh, that are emulated from previous successful examples. So let's first look at tariffs and subsidies, which have been prevalent all the way back to perhaps most prominently the U.S. in the 19th century, which has very, very high tariffs. So Ethiopia uses tariffs, for example, in the garment industry to protect domestic firms producing for the domestic market and subsidies, for example, tax holidays, which is an indirect subsidy for firms that produce for the export market. The second uh, tool, if you want to call it that, is the use of development banks. In Ethiopia, they've set up the Development Bank of Ethiopia, which has been very, very crucial in providing long-term capital for investment projects. Again, development banks have been of overwhelming importance in almost all catch-up economies going back to 19th century France. Another one is five-year development plans. Again, lots of countries have used these dating all the way back to the Soviet Union. The setup of state-owned enterprises. In Ethiopia, the most prominent example of this is perhaps the Ethiopian Airlines. Um, and if you go back to the Asian Tigers again, especially Taiwan uh, had a very, very high share of state-owned enterprises in the economy, but also South Korea and Singapore. Today, you'll find lots of state-owned enterprises in countries like China and Vietnam. Another point is, the, and this has become much more, I would say, uh, crucial and also prominent today is a strategic attraction of foreign direct investments. And here I put emphasis on strategic attraction and the use of industrial clusters to cater for foreign firms. Taiwan in the 1970s being an example. Um, and again, today Vietnam and China attract quite a few foreign firms in their industrialization strategies and also using export processing zones to cater for these foreign firms. Okay, I'll leave it at that. and give it over to Adam. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, good evening. I'm happy to be here. I used to be in academia for 13 years before joining the UN. Uh, for the last, I've uh, been with the UN for the last uh, 11 years. Uh, I would like to thank Antonio and his colleagues at SAWAS for this opportunity and to share with you some ideas about the project we, are, we have started a few years ago on industrialization in Africa. When I, when I was a young uh, graduate student, like most of you, uh, we used to read economic theories. And I today look back and I think that those economic theories which we used to study are the theories and models that failed Africa. Really. It's not what we teach ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a student, undergraduate student in the 80s, we had theories of economic dualism. Do you still use Tudaro? <laughs> it was mainly about economic dualism advising developing countries, Africa in particular, to neglect agriculture in favor of manufacturing. Africa and many developing countries failed to promote manufacturing by neglecting agriculture. Later on, because of food insecurity issues and so on, Africa was advised to go back to agriculture, to promote agriculture, and leave manufacturing to the private sector, it didn't work either. So now we need to have a more comprehensive development model. And that was the starting point for our work on industrialization in Africa. We have a sister organization in the United Nations called UNIDO, but we were not satisfied with what UNIDO was doing because UNIDO has ideological bias and a model that focuses on uh, sectors, a sectoral, a sectoral approach. We need a comprehensive approach, a development and planning approach that 
looks at industrial policy as a, a central policy that should be integrated and coherent with all other economic policies, including fiscal policy, monetary policy, and others, but not a sectoral policy. And industrial policy should not be left to the market. For too long, uh, Africa relied on the market, but the market did not solve very, very uh, simple constraints and issues. We asked ourselves, and we had a meeting with the former governor of Central Bank of Nigeria, why is Nigeria exporting, uh, exporting crude oil, but importing refined oil? It's unbelievable. Nigeria is a big country with huge agricultural potential. Nigeria imports almost all the tomato paste they consume. Do they need uh, rocket science to, to produce tomato paste? No. But why the private sector was not able to do it? Here is the issue of market failures. And government has to step in to help address issues of market failure. So a lot of economists will tell you, now be careful, especially international financial institutions, will tell you industrial policy is too risky and they confuse the definition of industrial policy. For us, it is very simple. Government cannot replace the private sector. For us, industrial policy it have, it's ab about addressing the constraint that, uh, that you know, uh, constrain private investment in diversified industries and in manufacturing in particular. <laughs> and there are five constraints which we have uh, identified early on. One, access to market. Two, infrastructure. Three, uh, access to finance. Four, human capital. Fifth, institutions in general, institutions that pro that promote the investment environment and that regulate uh, uh, and support businesses. So this is why we started to work on uh, industrialization. I'm going to be very brief because I would like to really listen to your questions and comments. So we started to work on this early on in uh, 2010. Uh, we produced a report on promoting high level sustainable growth to reduce unemployment in Africa and we identified the issues with Africa's growth model, which is very limited and highly dependent on uh, primary commodities. So uh, the narrow growth and the low quality growth uh, Professor Hazim talked about. 2011, we looked at the key questions which we identified and produced a report on governing development in Africa, the role of the state in economic transformation. So we uh, we identified the issue with market failures in Africa and that we argued that governments have to step in. No country on earth developed relying on market forces. Government has to have a role, has to have a role. And uh, 2012, we looked at whether Africa has the potential to become a global growth pole. Does Africa really have the resources and the opportunities? And the answer is yes. And we have very simple simulations that show that with good policies, Africa can double its share in, gro in, in global growth in about 15 to 20 years. Global output, Africa's share in global output can be doubled in a matter of 15 to 20 years. Uh, 2013, we looked at the most uh, challenging question that relates to uh, primary commodities. Africa has a lot of co primary commodities. Probably 50 to 60% of natural resources in the world today are in Africa. And we start to look at the question of can Africa really industrialize, beginning with its comparative advantage in natural resources? Of course, the answer is yes. But comparative advantage is not enough. You have to, to use your competitive advantage to eventually build competitive advantage in new industries. And not all African countries are rich in commodities. Uh, then th that report was about making the most of Africa's commodities, starting with competitive advantage, moving on to promote competitive advantage. Then 
2014, we looked at the question why industrial policy has, has not been successful. Very briefly, it has not been successful because as dictated by international financial institutions, African countries were advised almost all the time to have generalized industrial policies, uh, including tax holidays, uh, including uh, access to cheap finance, and so on, uh, that really did not work, did not attract uh, the kind of investment that will help African countries to diversify their economies. So they need new kind of industrial policy, well-targeted industrial policies. Uh, uh, 2015, we produced a report on industrializing through trade, industrializing Africa through trade. Now we are working on a report which we are going to uh, launch uh, along with the book on smart industrialization on greening Africa's industrialization. And the year after, we will have a report on industrialization and urbanization. Uh, this shows, you know, how committed we are to the question of industrialization because without industrialization, there is no hope for Africa to really promote sustainable and inclu inclusive development. And we believe that Africa can industrialize. Africa of today, very briefly, is very different from the Africa uh, when I was a student like most of you here. Africa of 20 years ago was very different. Now, most Afri many African countries have really put in place institutions uh, that promote macroeconomic stability as well as uh, growth and uh, provide a, a good environment and conducive environment for investment and so on. So we have seen this pain for Africa during the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Africa was the continent that was, that was able, more than many other uh, regions, to mitigate the influence and, 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 and negative impact of those crises. And we can see Africa moving forward despite the challenges and despite the growth moderation we are seeing now, we are very confident that African countries will pull ahead, but they are still highly, heavily dependent on primary commodities and they need to break from this dependence. So translating Africa's growth into meaningful creation of jobs requires long-term institutions and policies. And uh, Africa uh, uh, needs uh, to really invest more on its on processing its natural commodities. And to need, Africa needs to have new kind of industrial policies, uh, which Hajun talked about, uh, industrial policies uh, that are dynamic and organic, foster public-private sector dialogue, ensure high level of coordination and political support, and grant embedded autonomy, and uh, enhance regulatory effectiveness, and so on. So I'm actually uh, trying to market these products. <laughs> I will show you the link to, to our uh, products in our uh, website. But the key question we started to ask in 2012 was, what are the factors that influence linkage development in the hard and soft commodity sectors and perpetuate Africa's dependence on natural uh, resource extraction and exports? And we, we developed the framework, linkage for backward, forward linkage development, and when we assessed all these factors uh, that affect linkage development in Africa, I'm not going to go through these factors, uh, but we have conducted 10 country case studies in 2012 uh, and provided recommendations on how African countries can really address these factors and promote linkage development uh, at local level. And then also insert their uh, firms into the global, regional and global value chains. And we provided a lot of examples. African countries are highly, really, unlike what we hear in the media, African countries are highly integrated into the global economy, but unfortunately at the lower level. They just 
produce commodities uh, in this report uh, we had we provided figures that show that African countries earn just 10 percent of the global value of the goods produced based on their own uh, commodities including cocoa including uh, coffee including uh, a lot of metals so African countries earn just 10 percent of the global value chain based on the commodities they produce and you can see the potential there uh, we also looked at the critical success factors and provided uh, a framework uh, for African countries to make the most of their commodities. But to start with, African countries need to have long-term development plans and strategies. To go back to long-term development planning, the issues Professor Hagun talked about, no country on earth developed without having long-term development visions and plans. And Africa has to do that. And within that framework, African countries need to think outside the box. And I always say this to African policymakers. Nobody, including African like me, who work for international organizations, will think outside the box for you. You have to do it yourself. And we have seen it happening in a number of African countries. I just want to give you some examples. Uh, Morocco started very recently to invest on new technologies and processing, they started processing goods based on primary commodities produced in sub-Saharan Africa, processed in Morocco, exported to Europe. But they saw the limitation of this in terms of job creation. And then they, 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 they started to invest on, in, 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 in modern te technology, high-tech industries. And just uh, guess now, they produce parts and components for Airbus, for Boeing, for Rene, and for uh, uh, Nissan. And they created close to 20,000 jobs in these industries in, a, in a, a few years of time. And the potential is huge. And we have seen how Ethiopia, I, I, always, I always mention Ethiopia because I'm, I come from a country next to Ethiopia, Sudan. But for us, Ethiopia was known for, you know, uh, famines, drought, famines, and famine, and so on. <laughs> Especially in, in the 1980s. And uh, believe it or not, uh, 20 years ago, per capita income in Ethiopia was $90. $90 a year is per capita income. And Ethiopia was one of the poorest two countries on earth. Now, government put in place long-term development strategy. Of course, the country still has a lot of challenges, and you will still see uh, pictures in TV. You know, people still suffer from uh, food shortage due to a nano and the drought. But government in Ethiopia has consistently focused attention on addressing the challenges I mentioned, building infrastructure. Uh, providing finance to investors, improving access to markets, and building human capacity. And per capita income now is uh, seven times what it used to be, one. Two, infrastructure now, you see roads, and you see uh, power lines everywhere you go. And I was involved in the discussion on uh, the Millennium, the Great Millennium Dam, which costs $5 billion. World Bank IMF advised government not to invest on it because they said you will be bankrupt. Your economy will collapse. Ethiopia was able to generate most of the resources needed domestically. And you know the story about migrant, about uh, diaspora bonds and the uh, national uh, national uh, power, uh, the dam uh, bonds sold uh, domestically, and then the country was able to raise more than $1 billion in uh, Wall Street. Uh, 
And now World Bank is coming back to be part of this story. <laughs> really? With the postcode, the yeah. real yeah. state-owned ski company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, 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 we also looked at the issues of uh, industrial policy institutions. We need to have dynamic institutions. Uh, the report is there for you to read. But we are calling on African countries to have a new approach to, in the, to industrial policy, not the old failed industrial policy. But the government has to be at the center of this, not, as, not to own investment, not to own uh, product, productive enterprises, but to provide the environment, to, to provide the institutions that help the country and the investors to address uh, constraints and build on their potential. So this is a kind of industrial policy I want them to have in place, is industrial policy that is coordinated and that is integrated and coherent with overall development policies and strategies. And we want industrial policy organizations that address the uh, issues we identified with existing industrial policies, which are which including structural holiness, operational failures, and lack of dynamism, and uh, lack of inclusion. Uh, in 2015, uh, we looked at issues of trade and industrialization in Africa, and I think Professor Hadoun talked about the key findings and opportunities for Africa to have really to have uh, industrial policies that are fully integrated with their uh, trade policies, and for for them to do that, we propose this mo this framework for for policy making. You have to start with a national development strategy, and then identify uh, opportunities for trade and the, and the challenges constraints and how to address them and to have selective in the, uh, trade policies. Trade theory is about selective trade policy. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I will invite you to look at uh, those of you who study trade theory, the old trade theory, comparative advantage is not enough. Trade has to be based on uh, selective uh, instruments and selective instruments are not based only on comparative advantage and of course uh, Professor Hadjoun wrote extensively and we, I have Professor and my mentor uh, uh, Professor Mashjiko uh, Nisanki she, she, she was my mentor 20, more than 20 years ago <laughs> and I'm, we are proud to have her with us all the time now uh, she has supported us with our work on industrialization so unless you have selective instruments uh, that can help you to promote competitive advantage then you will not get anywhere uh, now let me move to the final part of my uh, my presentation moving forward what are we doing to help African countries really industrialize. Uh, what we are doing in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa is really to help African countries build capacity. Uh, many economists, many of, some of them very famous, tell African countries that you cannot develop or industrialize because you do not have the capacity. But they do not tell them how to address capacity issues. So we are supporting them through advisory service uh, to uh, build capacity. And they, they are working with us very closely. And we had developed a program that can help us work together with countries and with regional uh, economic communities to uh, have industrial policy frameworks that can promote uh, industrialization at national and regional level. Uh, because like just, uh, uh, Professor Hadjoun said, uh, you know, this, you, you need to really today, you need to, uh, to understand uh, how uh, industry, the industry operates regionally and globally. We, uh, value chains now dominate production at all levels, at national, 
regional and global levels. So industrial policy has a strong regional and global dimension. That is why we are bringing countries to work together. And uh, we are bringing them to work together and we also managed within the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and with partners to really put Africa's development issues and thinking on the table. And we really influenced major uh, agenda today, so starting with uh, uh, Agenda 2063, if you heard about it, that is, uh, that is Africa's agenda for transformation adopted by African head of states uh, in 2013. And we use that framework actually uh, to develop a common African position on post-2015 development agenda. And that common position, African position, really influenced the global uh, development agenda adopted by the General Assembly uh, in September 2015 in the, in the form of the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we also, uh, which talks about industrialization and, f and structural transformation. Uh, we also influenced the Financing for Development Conference, the outcomes of that conference that was held in Addis Ababa in July 20. And uh, all the priorities, Africa's priorities, are reflected uh, there. Also, we, uh, regionally, we have a comprehensive African agricultural development program that 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 advocates integration between agriculture and manufacturing. And we have Africa's program for infrastructure. Then we were able to work with the uh, African Development Bank very recently at UNIDO uh, to, for the bank to provide financial support to African countries to address the constraints I talked about. Uh, uh, sorry for the, I think uh, it should be, actually, yeah, uh, starting with uh, uh, access to finance as one of the key enablers and support, supportive policy, legislation and institutions and promoting conducive economic environment, infrastructure, and then access to markets, not capital here, and uh, human capital. These are the priorities for African countries. Therefore, if someone tells you that industrial policy is dangerous, is risky, uh, uh, ask them about how they define industrial policy. This is how we define industrial policy. And we think that industrial policy is a must for African countries. All the reports I mentioned are available on our website. Thank you. Okay, um, I think there is lots of food for thoughts. <laughs> so we uh, would like to have it, uh, an open discussion. Uh, so if you have questions, we could start raising uh, three, four questions. Okay, I still already see. Okay, let's start collecting three questions, and uh, you can also introduce yourself, and then we will have another round. Please. Um, uh, Hassan Chogun, first year PhD in economics. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor John. Um, just to see where I have questions. First, industrial policy um, as an infant industry for non-central countries uh, can go together with comparative advantage. My question is, um, under, uh, where was the theoretical foundation of this view? Why is it not a normalization of the mainstream nuclear classical view of um, comparative advantage that a lot of people think about structural transformation? Uh, second, um, you said that industrial policy measures are still allowed for NDCs and the WTO. Uh, to what extent is that they are also applicable to developing countries? Then, uh, Professor Adam, uh, is North Africa part of the uh, report? Yes. Please, and then, yeah, if you can just uh, raise your voice, 
in the in the team because um, it couldn't get too many kills on on the commander team. Like they theoretically is quite different from the before I first prepared because this uh, the thirty thirty one is about to have an advantage based on commodities. So how do we benefit it based on our Whereas this one, it's about that and more. The more being you can actually defy those comparative advantages. Um, uh, and so I'm just wondering why those uh, those inconsistencies, or, or are they part of a, a whole? Then, can I ask a second question? Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, the second question is that there has been this push towards infrastructure and growth. So let's let's start with this first round. Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. Well, when I say you need to use infant industry and com comparative advantage industries uh, together, I mean, I mean uh, you apply those things to different industries. Yeah? So some countries should be subject to infant industry promotion, others that uh, should be promoted as a comparative advantage industry that will allow you to on the foreign exchanges that you need uh, for economic development, you know, that this is what uh, people often get confused. I mean, the fact that countries like uh, Korea and Taiwan emphasize export was uh, that is uh, misinterpreted because that uh, people think they emphasize export for the sake of export. No, they didn't. They did it to be able to earn the foreign exchange that you need as a developing country to buy advanced machines and technologies to develop the next generation infant industries. Eh? So you need a portfolio. Eh? I mean, if you cannot put everything into infant industry development, you cannot you know, put everything into the, 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 the promoting cheap labor exports. Uh, you need a mixture. And you know the, the reason why you need to do some degree of uh, sectoral policies is because you know the, what is wrong with the neoclassical theory is that that uh, in, you know in neoclassical theory you keep accumulating capital and then the capital output, uh, so your capital labor ratio will uh, go up and then uh, you can move into new industries. It doesn't work like that in real life because that, that industrial development requires capabilities that that need to be accumulated at the sectoral level. Yeah? You can't just uh, keep producing uh, the t-shirts and one day having seen that your capital output ratio, that uh, labor ratio is at, uh, now above a certain level, suddenly start producing automobile. No, you cannot do that because you need to accumulate this 
capabilities. And this uh, also links uh, to this uh, question of infrastructure-led uh, the growth uh, because, uh, you know, yes, I mean, there'll be, if you invest a lot in infrastructure, there'll be some uh, the effect on the industrial development, but, you know, it's, there's no infrastructure that is uh, completely neutral. Yeah? No, I mean, the, uh, infrastructure is actually very location specific. Yeah? It has different impacts on different sectors. Yeah? So the, if you are using the same money to build a rail link between, I don't know, copper mine and the seaport, it has very different impacts on different industries from when you build an airport for a flower exporting region. And you cannot, once you have built the airport, say, well, flower demand is at the falling, let's move this airport, we mold it into a railway so that we can increase copper export. No, this is the absurdity of this idea of general industrial policy. Because that even infrastructure, even education, except at the primary level, is very specific to different industries. Yeah? There's uh, no such thing as a general engineer. Yeah? Engineers are highly specialized. Either you're a me mechanical engineer or chemical engineer, electronics engineer. You can't just uh, say, well, we'll produce more engineers. Yeah? What kind of engineers? Why? You need a sectoral plan. Yeah? You know, uh, just think about this. I mean, the, the uh, Gulf countries have infrastructure coming out of their nose, yeah? It doesn't lead to industrialization, yeah? All the roads, all the ports, you know, uh, what are you going to use them for? Yeah? Uh, on the question of different uh, the tools for uh, different countries, in the WTO, yes, I mean, the, the WTO has basically made it easier to use uh, the policies that are more suited uh, to the developed countries. So like R&D subsidies, yeah? agriculture subsidies, but, you know, I mean, the developing countries also can use uh, some of these, you know, I mean, there are, you know, especially at the middle level countries, I mean, uh, there are countries that could uh, benefit a lot more from using R&D subsidies. Eh? You know, the Mexico, despite having twice the income level of China, only spends 0.4% uh, of GDP on the R&D. China spends 1.8%. Uh, eh? You know, Mexico could uh, clearly raise that uh, the R&D spending, but it's not doing it. But this is not because of the WTO. Eh? Uh, yeah, the final question on policy space, yes, I mean, of course, uh, the WTO and BITs and so on are not the end of the story. You know, IMF, the World Bank, foreign aid you know, uh, from rich countries. But uh, first of all, IMF and the World Bank, I mean, the constraints are not permanent. I mean, as far as uh, you repay the money, I mean, you can stop you know, listening to them. And actually, there was a point in the early 2000s when there were only about five countries in the whole world that was under IMF tutelage. I mean, actually, the IMF almost went bankrupt. Yeah? It was saved by the global financial crisis, yeah? because then a lot of countries got into trouble, and then it could lend money. Yeah? Uh, so, you know, of course, I mean, that this means that there'll be yeah, double, triple lock. So I completely take your point that, that, that this uh, need to be uh, taken into account. But uh, they, they are not, I mean, uh, completely limiting. But yeah, at another level, the biggest constraint might be ideology. Because there's such an ideological dominance of uh, free market, free trade ideas that, you know, even if uh, they instinctively feel that they need to use different policies, even if, you know, they, they have no kind of formal regulations like the WTO or even informal regulations coming from the aid yeah, conditionalities and so on, developing country policymakers are not even thinking about using some of the policies because that they have been trained to think in a particular way. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Excellent questions. Uh, uh, question one. Uh, uh, partly answered by uh, 
Professor Hajun. North Africa is part of, uh, we always, for us, North Africa is part of our work. And uh, for us, in our report, we don't use the term Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. It's a colonial uh, term. We do not use it anywhere. Africa is one continent. Uh, uh, and uh, we insist on this regional integration within Africa is really the best way forward for Africa. I did not have time to mention this. 60% of inter-Africa trade is in manufactured goods. Produce any kind of goods, clothes in West Africa, sell it to neighbor countries. They buy, but you cannot sell it outside Africa. It's difficult to compete. 60% of inter-Africa exports are in manufactured goods. So just imagine the potential for the continent to industrialize based on regional market. So uh, uh, I hope that one day uh, the term sub-Saharan Africa will disappear. Mm. Uh, ERS are related. ER economic reports on Africa are related. Uh, uh, there is apparent contradiction uh, between some of them, especially 2013, on making the most of Africa's commodities. And the last one, and the report, and the, the, the book being uh, written by uh, Professor Hajun and his colleagues, there is slight difference in how we see comparative advantage. But I think, the, in essence, there is no contradiction. What is comparative advantage about for us? As far as we are concerned, comparative advantage is about making the most of what you already have. Mm -hmm. If you produce diamond, then cut it, polish it locally. You make a lot of money. And uh, you need to enforce local contents policies that can force companies that extract diamond to cut it and polish it locally. And by doing that, you can create a lot of jobs. Botswana, South Africa have created a lot of jobs by just enforcing local content policy on diamond cutting and polishing. If you produce leather, then process it and go to the next stage to produce fine leather products, including shoes. Based on your comparative advantage, uh, you have uh, crude oil in Nigeria, refine it. Yeah, and, and so on. Uh, but we agree that uh, in f moving forward, you have to build competitive advantage. You have to be innovative, produce new products. And Professor Hajun made, gave a lot of examples. I mean, uh, we know the story of China. Professor uh, Machiko wrote about it. And uh, Korea, they do not have anything like Africa's natural resources, but they develop based on comparative advantage. So uh, uh, we need uh, for future development really to build comparative advantage and to invest a lot on human capital in particular and on technology, research and development. Now, uh, infrastructure led growth. Infrastructure, we cannot uh, build infrastructure just for the sake of building infrastructure. We build infrastructure to do something else, to move goods, facilitate movements of goods, capital, and so on, and investment, and so on. Uh, so infrastructure must be given the scarcity of resources. Of course, it is good to have good roads everywhere, but given the scarcity of resources, we should uh, focus on building infrastructure that promotes investment and promote uh, uh, facilitate marketing and so on. Uh, uh, well, the last question uh, about uh, policy space, uh, which Professor Hajun uh, answered, talked about. But for us, policy space, really as we defined it, is about ownership of your national mm. development strategies.
and we articulated this issue very clearly and very strongly in the context of Agenda 2063 and the Sustainable Development Agenda and uh, Addis Ababa Action Agenda on Financing for Development. In order to have policy space, you need to rely on your domestic resources. And therefore, we put forward the argument that external support provided to African countries should be leveraged to support African countries mobilize their own resources and use them the way they like. So if you cannot do that, then you will not have the policy space. And I think the work we have done in the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa over the years on debt cancellation in the 1990s and in the context of MDGs, although MDGs were very limited for us, and uh, in the context of aid flexibility has been very supportive. Now, most of the aid that goes to Africa is, goes to budget support. But previously, most of it used to go, be tied to projects and certain, you know, it, it constrained policy space in Africa. But now we want external support that supports Africa's capacity to, to mobilize resources and to widen its policy space. Okay, let's look at this, this side as well. Uh, one second and third one uh, up there. Try to be brief so we can have more questions. Yeah. People cannot hear, sorry. If you can just raise your voice, yeah. Thanks. So we have one question for June and two for Adam. Uh, yeah, uh, Inka and then, yeah. yeah. So my first uh, question is about the whole services that are processed in the past thirty days. I'm wondering if that is very useful because um, if you look at a lot of developing countries, the way services have been managed is very different from the way it's managed in the developed world, where there's an office of nice action. So maybe we need to, understand, to deepen our understanding of how services have been managed in um, developing countries and the way that they Then talking about the issue of developing capability, um, I feel like it's closely related to the political settlement because a lot of times those policy positions where um, people negotiate, they negotiate with uh, the sort of trade partners or formulate industrial policy, they're highly contested. So how do we make sure that the right people are in the room to formulate these policies? Because most, most times they're not. And then the last thing is about long-term development plans. Um, a lot of African countries have developing a long-term development plans for the days that we have here in Africa. In 2020, we have done that. What have been the Have they really led to any kind of development at all? Thank you. Can I do just a detour? Mushtaq, and then over there. Yeah. Okay, so this is a question for Adunza and also in general. In principle, I'm very much in favor of this report. I haven't read it, so I don't know if some of the things I'm going to be saying have already been covered. I think I completely agree with you that there is no blueprint for industrial policy. There's a lot of pragmatism, a lot of trial and effort, and you have to create the policies for the space. But in a sense, I'm, I'm not sure that the fundamental issue is the same. That is, when you try to build comparative advantage in sectors where you don't have it, you are supporting a sector which doesn't have enough productivity mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And then the idea is to build capabilities to learn by doing the investment to our new whatever, right? Now, in the past majority of cases in developing countries where industrial policy has failed, is because support was provided 
output expanded because as long as you're proposing output growth, then people say industrial policy is succeeding because output is growing. But then it turns out that productivity growth, which was sustained, isn't happening. And in the long run, then it's reverse and comes uh, crashing down. Right? So the trick is how to sustain that productivity growth, which will justify it. Now, this requires institutional capacity and political capacity to compel productivity growth to very tough decisions. Now, in many of the examples that you gave, you know, Vietnam, Ethiopia, which I worked in, actually what you find is that the output growth is happening, the productivity growth isn't happening, and for example, automobiles in Vietnam, there's a collapse of industrial policy and they're withdrawing from it because they couldn't do it. So if you are now going to advise African countries to do this, and I think we should, and we must, and I agree with you that without industrial policy, there is no future, you need to think very carefully about how those particular sectors that are being supported are going to achieve productivity growth, what are the institutional mechanisms, and that's connected to the question that someone else asked about the political settlement, because what works in one country won't work in another country for very specific reasons to do with the distribution of power. What is the power of the sectors you're supporting in terms of their political networks and connections? How do you work around that? Without that, you just create another set of, nothing succeeds like success, right? You, you, you try something, after five or six years, it won't work, and then you'll have another set of resources, and you must avoid that. Mm -hmm. okay. The last question, and then we do the final round. Right, right, right. Uh, yes, uh, so many questions is uh, not possible to address them. Uh, yes, uh, very quickly, intellectual property rights. There is uh, the famous TRIPS agreement, trade-related intellectual property rights uh, agreement in the WTO. Today is uh, the main role when it comes to most African countries is to access so that to restrict access to medicine, yeah, seeds, and other things that they need. But tomorrow it'll they'll become it'll become restriction on absorbing advanced technologies yeah, because uh, it'll make buying technologies so much more expensive. It'll make it so much more difficult to reverse engineer things and so on. So that this uh, issue has to be addressed. But you know. I mean, that, that, that for obvious reasons that, 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 that this is that, uh, not being done. Huh? Uh, well, services versus manufacturing, I'm not sure what you mean by different kinds of services, uh, but, you know, yes, I mean, in the report, we talk about the need to look at sort of certain types of high productivity producer services as part of an industrial strategy uh, because, yeah, a lot of services have been 
kind of at least organizations separated from the manufacturing sector and you need to pay attention to them. But if you buy these different services mean, I don't know, things like cultural exports, uh, medical tourism and things like that, that are often talked about. The problem with those things is that they are very, very insignificant. Yeah? For example, let me give you a figure. I mean, that Czechoslovakia has the largest, in proportional terms, trade surplus in the export of, uh, the, in, the, in, in the trade in medical services. Yeah? And it accounts for 1.3% of GDP. Yeah? And it's by far the largest yeah? in the world. Yeah? I mean, even the US is like 0.3%. Yeah? So if uh, the people think that the countries can become rich on the basis of medical services, tourism, cultural services, I think uh, they need to really look at the numbers. Eh? But I wasn't necessarily implying that uh, you're asking the question. Eh? Uh, yeah, question of uh, political settlements. I mean, we, we do, I mean, that uh, mentioned the importance of uh, having the right political basis uh, the, for these policies. You know, I mean, as my good friend, the Norwegian economist Eric Reiner keeps saying, Latin America is the United States where the South won the civil war. Yeah? Basically, the landlord controlled these things that are for too long, and you know, they just uh, didn't want the kind of industrialization they uh, could engineer in, the, say, East Asian countries after the land reform. So we are aware of uh, these uh, the limitations, uh, but you know, addressing these uh, the political constraints uh, that that uh, is uh, very country specific, sector specific exercise. We, I mean, uh, didn't get to go into that. However, at the broad level, we did mention that you know political coalitions can be and have been rebuilt. Yeah? I mean, we only cite national examples, but I'm sure that you can find a lot of examples at the sectoral level. Uh, value theories. Well, I suppose that uh, my point is that there will be, I mean, first of all, uh, it is important to make policymakers aware of different economic theories, you know, which uh, do not just give different policy conclusions, but uh, conceptualize the world in different ways. Yeah? But at the more pragmatic level, I don't know whether they'll have to study value theory, because uh, you know, as it is, policymakers in developing countries are struggling with huge burden. Yeah? I mean, it's not because they are less intelligent, but, you know, that, that there are so few people, you know, that they don't have time to do anything. Even in rich country governments, you know, my rule of thumb is that, 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 that if you're at the lowest level of uh, government hierarchy, you might occasionally read 30% report. If you are a section chief, five pages. If you are deputy minister, two pages. If you are minister, half a page. If you are the president, two lines, yeah? No, this is a reality. Yeah? So you have to accept that these people won't have t enough time to, you know, to study the intricacies of uh, the Marxist value theory or the, you know the Adam Smith's uh, the theory of uh, uh, material production. So you know that uh, realistically speaking, you know that what uh, we can reasonably expect that, uh, from these people is that a they are aware that there are different ways of uh, theorizing about the economy so they don't get uh, browbeaten by some World Bank economists uh, saying free trade is a truth. Yeah? And then secondly, they'll have to know some theories uh, to be able to make an argument when uh, the World Bank economists say, well, capital labor, yeah, the ratio and comparative advantage, they should have the knowledge to say, yeah, but that's assuming that capabilities are given, technologies are blueprints, but deeper than that, I think that uh, they uh, practically don't have uh, time to uh, the learn. Yeah, thanks. Another set of good questions. Uh, let me be brief. Uh, the question on uh, aid conditionality and how it affects uh, financing in Africa. Again, I would like to refer you to 
at this our action agenda on financing for development and the Africa uh, Africa's regional consultations in preparation for uh, financing for development conference emphasize domestic resource mobilization as uh, uh, the main source of financing Africa's development and international support by donors and by international financial institutions should be focused on building capacity for African countries to mobilize and better manage their own resources. And uh, among the resources we are talking about, not just uh, private savings and uh, public uh, revenue and so on, but also Africa loses a lot of money in the form of illicit financial flows because African countries sell their uh, natural resources very cheap through natural resource contracts that really end up ripping Africa of huge resources that can be used to finance its development. Uh, we have a report on that available on our website by a panel chaired by uh, President Thabo Mbiki, uh, former president of South Africa. Uh, on the question of uh, on trade agreement, economic report on Africa 2015 talks about the importance of uh, trade policy reforms and uh, negotiating agreements that, uh, that, 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 that help Africa really develop its domestic market first before opening it to the rest of the world. So we are calling on all African countries to negotiate together. This is the main point. They have to negotiate together. Uh, finally, on the question of uh, why uh, uh, industrial policy did not work in, in Nigeria, uh, economic report on Africa 2014 on dynamic industrial policy is exactly about this question, and Nigeria is one of our case studies. It did not work in Nigeria, in many African countries, because in the, in the context of structural adjustment programs, African countries were advised to leave everything, thinking, even thinking, to the market. <laughs> yeah, to the market. And then they have token blueprint industrial policies that are hollow. They have nothing inside, no institutions to support them. Nothing, they don't work, they can't work. And that's why Nigeria is really started very recently to think more carefully about industrial policies that can work. And now the current government, despite the challenges of security and the falling oil prices, started with building infrastructure, making use of about 50% of Nigeria's reserves to build infrastructure. Nigeria has a lot of money to, uh, in the past, of course, that was squandered, that could have been put on infrastructure, uh, but it was not. Uh, but one of our colleagues who work also on this report is now the advisor to the president, he's the economic advisor to, to the president. And hopefully he will provide the kind of thinking mm -hmm. needed. Uh, okay, uh, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Joseph, if you want to add something, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me just briefly add something to the uh, topic of services versus manufacturing. Um, as I mentioned, and as it was mentioned here, there are some new avenues uh, to find in services-led growth. Um, but I have to second what, what Hajun said here, that I don't think it's very, very difficult to become or experience the transition from low to high income purely based on the uh, specialization of, of services with no manufacturing, unless maybe you're a very, very, very small economy. Uh, we do also mention the importance of trying to engage more in producer services um, especially now that in certain global value chains, those where the manufacturing part of the activities are relocated by certain transnational corporations to uh, developing countries, footwear, garments, toys, uh, textiles, and so on, there is a greater need to try and engage in the producer services to get higher, basically higher profits, um, such as branding and design and so on. So this is something I think although difficult at the stage of development a lot of African countries are at, uh, is more important. And just to quickly add something to the debate on defying versus uh, conforming to comparative advantage, as Adam said, I think there are very, very s small differences here, but I do think uh, we all agree on that 
countries should use the endowments that they have for the benefit of the economy, but economic development or the process of economic development is about structural change, and this does not happen uh, automatically, or this does not happen purely by conforming to comparative advantage. Okay, we, we are actually uh, over time, but are there any last important questions that you think we should really raise? <laughs> if there are any, please raise your hand. Okay, Leonardo, yes, I promised Leonardo. So someone else? Three, and that's it. <laughs> okay, please, Leonardo, if you can start. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, one thing that I, I think was you stressed a lot with the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I was just informed that there, are, there is another event in oh. a few minutes. So if I may ask June to give one last minute, two minutes comments on Leonardo's point, yeah. and then I will close with just an announcement. Okay, yeah, no, no, frankly, we didn't really address uh, the question of finance. I mean, partly because uh, that we basically defined uh, industrial policy rather specifically, we didn't write a report on industrialization strategy, which would have to include the financial institutions, but this was more kind of narrowly defined industrial policy. But yes, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, we need financial institutions that are committed to long-term financing. We need uh, financial regulation that would uh, manage uh, in interest rate and exchange rate at, uh, at the right level. You know, the Brazilian uh, yeah, macroeconomic policy of the last uh, 20 years has been you know, Brazil has a good industrial policy, but it uh, cannot function because real interest rate is 10%. Currency is always uh, that uh, overvalued. So, you know, I mean, I completely agree with you that uh, these are the questions that have to be, yeah. Adam, we just want yeah, to just 10 seconds, seconds and listen to this question. Uh, we have a study uh, uh, written by, uh, mostly drafted by uh, Professor uh, Machu Konisanki on macroeconomic policy frameworks for a structural transformation. <laughs> we are launching uh, in April and it will be available on our website. Okay, thanks. Let me just conclude this event saying that we are going to have another occasion to discuss on Africa uh, challenges. Uh, India is the 12th, right? 12th of March uh, here at SOAS again. And uh, the next event within this uh, series, uh, we are going to move to Southeast Asia. Uh, the event is going to be co-organized with Action Aid uh, for the report, the Diversify and Conquer. The event is going to be called Beyond Garments, Prospects for Economic Diversification in Bangladesh. You will receive information, but it's on the 10th of March at the Senate House here at uh, 6. And Professor Mushtaqan will be one of the main uh, leading discussants in that, in that uh, event. Thanks a lot. <laughs>